This is Reality Dispatch, written by Jim Mintz. Eight thirty-three p.m. Tim unclipped the hinges to the cable case and laid the final of the XLRs under the stage to the lecterns. He had worked for Mitch as his assistant audio engineer for three years, but they had never had a job quite like this one. The vice president and the former president were due to take the stage in 27 minutes. All that remained were the DBS 55Ks, the model number for the subsonic microphones that would plug into the XLR cables aligned to each lectern. Tim unclipped the box that housed one of the microphones and removed the long device from its protective silk clothing. It was heavy, giving gravitas to its reputation as one of the best and most expensive broadcast microphones on the market. Most networks didn't bother to buy them as they would go through microphones like bullets at a shooting range. Besides, they were advocates of the lapels, and Mitch's small business was one of the few operators that housed this particular mic probably one of the reasons why they were selected to run sound for the debate. There was an expectation that the audience would be somewhere in the 100 to 150 million viewers watching these two go neck and neck with pot shots and name calling. Tim was only invested in seeing his hard work broadcast to the widest possible audience. He was confident that the audio would go off without a hitch. The expense both he and Mitch had poured into their equipment had not failed them on every job they had worked on. So why would this circumstance be any different? even if the entire world was watching. Tim, we need to run a test on the Longhorns, said Tim's radio emitting from his hip. Longhorn was Mitch's nickname for the expensive microphones. The talent will be taking the stage imminently, which means you need to get off. Plug them in and run a test quickly. Tim retrieved the radio from his belt buckle and pleaded for more time. Can you lapel them first and I leave this to the last minute? I'm worried that they will need to be cross-checked with the upstairs mixers for any interference first, Tim requested. No, Mitch yelled back. There are no lapels. They are only running long horns, and you should have had them plugged in and ready to go by now. They will be muting the audio when a candidate is not talking, and the booth operator is yelling at me now to deliver a test. So for the love of God, plug them in and run the test. Tim jammed the long horn in his hand into the XLR joint on the lectern one. He unclipped the case holding the second longhorn, removed it from its silk clothing, and ran it over to lectern two, where it flew out of his hand and landed on the polished concrete floor beneath the stage with a loud crack. Tim's heart sank as he looked around to see how many members of the ABC and CNN crew had witnessed his accident. It was too dark to discern a clear number. He ran over to the mic on the floor, what was left of it, picked it up, and ran it back over to the second lectern. There he jammed it into the XLR patch and felt a strained force almost prevent him from achieving a perfect click. Have you run the test? Mitch asked on the radio. Tim felt his pulse pummel in his neck. A floor manager ran over to him and waved him from the stage. The Secret Service is here. You need to scram, he yelled. Tim backed away from the lectern, realizing that it was too late to make a change and pray for a miracle. He watched men in pitch black suits and earpieces enter the studio and swarm to the stage. They motioned for him to leave. He had no choice now. He could not be sure of the damage he had caused to the microphone. It was five minutes to the debate. He wouldn't know the extent of the damage until the candidates began their speeches. He wasn't sure which candidate would be positioned at the lectern of concern. All would be revealed, but if the damage was as evident as the smash Tim had witnessed, his reputation for a job badly done would extend beyond the Pennsylvania networks and more broadly, perhaps globally. The lights dimmed and the candidates entered. Tim's heart sank as he saw the former president take the lectern in question. He could no longer watch and he left the taping and headed for the street below, lighting a cigarette before he had exited the building entirely. For more stories of fact-based fiction, head to jimmins.substack.com.